We listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. We pray for illumination. Faithful God, we wait for you as people called from the deep to new sunrises of your mercies. Meet us here. Rekindle in us the gift of faith. Warm it in our open hands. Breathe it into our spirits. Light it in our hearts. Amen. There are three letters in the New Testament that are grouped together and called the pastoral epistles. These are two letters addressed to a person called Timothy and one to a Titus. They claim to be letters written by St. Paul, the same person who wrote the letters to the church in Rome, to the church in Galatia and many others. Except that they don't feel like the other letters of Paul. For example, Paul usually wrote to congregations, but these are to individuals. And also the letters talk about a Christian community that is far better organized, more institutionalized than that which we find in the other Pauline letters. So these and some other points have led many scholars to think that the pastoral letters were not actually written by St. Paul, but by someone heavily influenced by Paul and many years after Paul lived, perhaps even a century after Jesus had died. You have to imagine the author thinking, what advice would Paul give to a young person alive today? What advice can be given in the spirit of Paul? Now, although that might sound deceitful to us today, in ancient times, the idea of composing something in the name of a famous person was quite acceptable. It was, in a sense, a homage to that person and a way of continuing their thought and making it live anew. We can also ask the same question as that ancient author. What does the tradition of Christian interpretation founded by St. Paul have to say to us today and for this morning to say as seen through the lens of the second letter to Timothy? It's important to keep the context of the letter in mind. It was written early in the second century, the early 100s. If that was the case, then all those who had seen Jesus had died, along with all with uh, the all those sorry all those who had seen Jesus had died, along with the first generation of Christians, and the second generation was getting a bit long in the tooth too. The first generation of Christians was fired up with an enthusiasm; they had to be, as they were breaking with the old, their family traditions, to become Christians. It was all new for them, and it came at a cost. Families broken, people disinherited, perhaps imprisoned. The second generation would have caught some of that fire of the first. But what about the ones after that? Those Christians would have become more organized with patterns developing. Was the fire still there? As well, Christianity had become a little institutionalized, it was still not socially acceptable, though. It could be something of an embarrassment to be a Christian or to come from a Christian family. The reading from this letter alludes to those things. In particular, Timothy is reminded of the strength of faith of his mother and grandmother, almost as if to say, the faith is in your DNA, and so live it, or rather, how are you going to live your faith, your DNA, your family heritage in this new generation. That's enough for now. It's time to hear the passage. Please note that although the reading follows closely to the NRSV, the Bible in the pews, I have altered the translation at some points to better bring out some of the nuances of the original Greek of the letter. Thanks, Shasha. Chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. Pau an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. For the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank God, whom I worship 
with a clear, concise, the way my ancestors did. When I remember you always in my prayers, night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I'm sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to give fresh life to the gift of God that is within you through the laying on my, on, of my hands. Sorry. For God did not give us a spirit which is wish-washy, but instead of one that is powerful and loving and sensible. Do not be ashamed, then, of the witness of our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus from the beginning of time, but it has now been made known through the coming of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who put an end to death and revealed by means of the gospel life without decay. For this gospel, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted him. Hold to the example of some teaching that you have heard from me, in the faith and love, and that are in Christ Jesus, God the good which has been entrusted to you with the, hope, with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Our Gospel reading is from chapter 17 of the Gospel according to Luke. So it's quite a way into the story. Jesus has been going around teaching and healing uh, for over a dozen chapters now. The poor disciples are feeling a bit overwhelmed by all that teaching. For instance, the reading opens with a verse which tells, in which Jesus tells the disciples that they have to give a per, forgive a person seven times a day and every day, if necessary. And that's a tall order. The disciples aren't sure if they have the capacity to put all this teaching into practice. So they turn to Jesus for help. One other point. In the passage, Jesus says some pretty far-fetched things. And I wonder if he is not using exaggeration, something that's fairly common in the Gospels and throughout the Bible. I th if so, I think we need to imagine Jesus smiling as he says these things, a cheeky smile, if you like. In other words, Jesus here speaks with humor in his voice and not accusation. Thank you. According to Luke, Chapter 17, verse 5 to 10. Jesus said to the disciples, Be on your guard. If a brother or sister sins, you must rebuke the offender. If, and if there is a change of behavior, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day, and turns back to you seven times and says, Yes, I will be different. You must forgive. The apostles say to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field? Come here at once and take your place at the table. 
would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat and drink? Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are servants not deserving of special praise. We have done only what we should. In secret words of old, we have heard the Spirit speak anew. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that these human words may be the word of God for us this day, according to your promise through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Increase our faith, the disciples had asked Jesus. They had been so overwhelmed by the teaching of Jesus and little wonder. What had he just told them? That they were to forgive someone not just once a day or twice a day, but seven times a day if necessary. Someone who does wrong seven times a day is quite a repeat offender. How can you forgive such a person or keep on forgiving such a person? Then there was teaching about paying attention to others, like poor Lazarus at the gate of the rich man, or more teaching about not causing a person to stumble. The disciples must have been at a breaking point. How could they possibly do all of this? And so they asked Jesus, increase our faith. It's a perfectly natural response, one that we could have ourselves. If we take our Christian perspective seriously, we see the overwhelming magnitude of the tasks that confront us in this world. We do not feel adequate, so we desire more capabilities in order to manage the tasks and complete them all. And these tasks are noble. They're things like doing good, caring for the poor, forgiving others, and on a broader scale, bringing an end to violence both around us and overseas stopping environmental damage, preserving endangered species, and so on. The list is so huge, becomes, saying it becomes almost comical, cliched. We think, just like the disciples, that we could do so much more if we just had more resources within us, if we just had more faith, if our faith were bigger, then we could do more, and that would be better. Wouldn't it? If we just had more faith, or more of this, or more of that, then we could manage, couldn't we? What does Jesus say to the disciples when they come with this request for increased resources? If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, then you could say to that tree, move from this field and plant yourself in the ocean, and it would. Does that sound harsh to you? Is Jesus being critical of the disciples in his response? Is Jesus saying, if you had even the tiniest bit of faith, then you could work this miracle, but you don't have that sort of faith, so you can't do it? Well, maybe. But I'm not so sure of that because of the exaggerated nature of the examples Jesus gives. After all, why on earth would you want a tree growing in the middle of the sea. I mean, picture it. A lot of the disciples were fishermen. They would realize the value of having trees growing in the ocean, wouldn't they? In the morning, they'd say to the family, well, off to go fishing today, and while I'm out on the Sea of Galilee, I'll stop by the lemon tree and pluck a few lemons to have with our fish. And no doubt their wives would reply, oh, and go via the potatoes growing in the water and bring some of those home so we can have fish and chips. And the children would happily chortle and bring home some mulberries for dessert. It would be quite handy to have trees and potatoes growing in the lake, wouldn't it? The scenario is ridiculous. Why on earth would one command a tree to plant itself in the ocean? And that shows us that we shouldn't take the saying at face value why it's not a criticism of the disciples. A mustard seed was a very small seed, one of the smallest, 
So Jesus is referring to having the smallest, tiniest bit of faith. And the disciples had such faith. The mere fact that they were standing there with Jesus showed that they wanted to be with him, even if only the eensy weensiest bit. The mere fact that they followed Jesus and listened to his teaching showed that they had faith at least as big as the mustard seed. And by the way, you're all here in church this morning, that shows that you have faith the si at least the size of a mustard seed as well. But that doesn't mean we'll plant a forest in Lake Torrens. What the disciples need is not more faith. They don't need more resources. What they need is a new orientation, a new way of looking at the world. What Jesus had taught them had turned their old worldview topsy-turvy. No longer are rich people automatically presumed to be righteous. No longer are prostitutes or tax gatherers or lepers presumed to be outside of God's love. No longer are there in-groups and out-groups and carefully defined boundaries. The disciples had to adjust to this new way of looking at the world. And they are disoriented by it. We think that Luke wrote his gospel 30 or 40 or 50 years after the death of Jesus. Around that time, the first generation of Christians would have been starting to die out. Someone who had seen Jesus at age 20 would be almost 70, a long lifespan. So many of those who heard this gospel would have heard, only heard of Jesus second or third hand. I said earlier that the disciples felt overwhelmed. In reality, the audience for Luke's gospel would also feel quite overwhelmed by all the things that Jesus had said. How would they take all these teachings of Jesus and shape them into a way of life into the future? Jesus taught about a lifestyle that's radically different from that of the culture around him. The lifestyle of the kingdom of God, the community of divine love. It's easy to live a radically different lifestyle for a few years but much harder to carry it on for a lifetime. Kids need education, parents need aged care, and so on. Luke is saying to his audience, you have enough faith, you have enough resources to carry into the future. Well, what goes for the community of Luke goes even more so for the community to which Timothy belongs. As I mentioned before, the letter to Timothy is probably written for someone a generation after the Gospel of Luke. What does the life of faith look like then, further away from the time of Jesus? The author suggests a strategy that extends that given by Luke. And by the way, for simplicity, I'm just going to call the author Paul. Paul, firstly, Paul firmly locates Timothy in a tradition of strong faith by praising the faith of his mother and his grandmother. Down over there on the wall we have a plaque dedicated to Seymour who founded PGC, now Seymour College, and others like Scotch College. Over there there's a window to Thomas Elder, one of the great benefactors of Adelaide and South Australia. There's another plaque to Ian Tanner, who was a leader of the Uniting Church when it was new. And many of you will remember Heather Southcott with her commitment to equality and justice. And there are many, many war, more I could name. Paul says to Timothy, faith in Christ is part of your family heritage, your DNA. So don't think it is too small or too weak. Those remind us about us in this church say the same thing to us. Paul says more to Timothy. Timothy, he says, You've inherited a faith like a seed, even if you think it is the smallest seed. But a seed has life in it. It can grow into a great tree. So let your seed grow into a tree. Not the same tree as your grandmother, but a tree for the new situation, the new generation to which you belong. Your mother and your grandmother had a fire of faith. You have a spark from that fire. Let it too grow up into a fire let it be a new fire, your fire, for your times. Give fresh life to the gift God has given you.
And those words also apply to us. We have inherited the faith of others, of Elder Seymour, Tanner, Southcott, and others. But things have changed. As a community, as a church congregation, we must face those changes, new attitudes in society, changes in the makeup of our society itself. A generation gap that means that sometimes traditional ways of worshipping God and being church don't quite fit anymore, and so on. We repeatedly find that the world around us or within us has changed in some way, sometimes great, sometimes small. Each of these alterations means that our patterns of behaviour have to alter. Each of these alterations disorient us, disorients us in some way. Our role is not to preserve faith like a specimen pickled in formaldehyde, but to let it grow into something new, something that brings life to the changed circumstances in which we live. So how do we live into the future? There's no quick and easy answer to this question. The disciples thought that what was needed was increased faith. Jesus put pay to that solution with a joke about planting trees in the sea. We do not need more faith to cope with the changes around us. We have enough faith and more. We have enough resources to serve God and to live into the future. What we have to do is much harder than having faith. We have to discern how to live in faith into the future. Our reading from the letter to Timothy closes with two intriguing exhortations. Paul writes, Hold to the example of sound teaching that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus or as the NRSV translations say, the standard of sound teaching, the example of sound teaching. Now it's easy to misinterpret this statement. The author is not talking about what constitutes sound teaching, not about the content of that teaching. The author is talking about the lived example of that teaching. And if the author stands in the tradition of Paul, then what's being talked about are the things that Paul emphasized like reconciliation, faith, hope, love. Most importantly, building up the body of Christ, building up the community of love with acts of care. And I can imagine that this is the example given to Timothy by his mother and his grandmother, building up the community with acts of love. Next, the author writes, guard the good which has been entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. I wonder what that means. So I want to end the sermon with a question. What has been the good that has been entrusted to us by those who came before us? What has been the good that has been passed on to, to me, to you, to you, to you? How do you, how do we, preserve this in our current circumstances? Okay, that's more than one question, but really only one thought. How do we preserve what has been given to us and make it a living fire, a great tree? Amen.